This is Positively Farming Media. Hello, my gardening friends, and welcome back to the Just Grow Something podcast. This week, we're tackling onions. I will absolutely admit, I totally faked my way through growing onions the first few years, and I had mediocre results to start with. Part of the problem was that I didn't know that there were different onions for different growing situations. And the other part of it was that I didn't understand the nutritional needs for onions at the different stages of growth. And then add to that the fact that I was growing the wrong kind of onions for long-term storage and they were rotting before we could use them up. So today we're jumping into the first full crop episode of the new season all about onions, including background information, cultivation both in ground and in containers, pests and diseases, harvest, and storage. There is a ton of information to take in, but I promise if you keep the information handy, it makes it a lot easier to move forward with growing your own onions and it gets even easier with each attempt. Let's dig in. Hey, I'm Karen, and I started gardening 18 years ago in a small corner of my suburban backyard. When we moved to a five-acre homestead, I expanded that garden to half an acre, and I found such joy and purpose in feeding my family and friends. This newfound love for digging in the dirt and providing for others prompted my husband and I to grow our small homestead into a 40-acre market farm. When I went back to school to get my degree in horticulture, I discovered there is so much power in food, and I want to share everything I've learned with as many people as possible. On this podcast, we explore crop information, soil health, pests and diseases, plant nutrition, our own nutrition, and so much more in the world of food and gardening. So grab your garden journal and a cup of coffee and get ready to just grow something. So before we jump into onions, I want to announce that the merch shop has been updated with brand new designs for season three of the podcast. I had so much fun designing these, and one design in particular was requested by several of you based on the carrot episode way back when. So I finally got around to creating a Carrots Are Divas design, along with several others. The winter edition of the merchandise is live, and if you are a patron at the Seed Patron level or above over on Patreon, Be sure to check your email or the Patreon page for an exclusive discount code for this quarter for anything in the merch shop. And if you're not a patron yet, head to patreon.com slash justgrowsomething and join at the seed patron level for $5 a month and you will have immediate access to that discount code too. Okay, so on to onions. I did go over some of this information last fall when I talked about overwintering onions, but we haven't done a full start to finish everything you need to know episode, so here we are. And as usual with a crop specific episode, we are going to start with the basics. The scientific name for onions is Allium sepa, and it is in the plant family Amaryllidaceae. That is the Amaryllis family, yes, like the flower. Many times we refer to this large genus of onion or garlic scented bulbous kind of herbs that are in this family just simply as alliums or the allium family, just to differentiate them from the flowers. But technically, allium is a genus and that's a larger part or that's a part of the larger amaryllis family. So onions' cousins, basically, are garlic and chives and scallions and shallots and leeks. So according to the U.S. National Onion Association, yes, that's a thing, um, many archaeologists, botanists, and food historians believe that onions originated in Central Asia. But other research suggests onions were first grown in Iran and West Pakistan. Now, most researchers agree that the onion has been cultivated for more than 5,000 years. There are historical records with recipes dating from 5,000 years ago that include domesticated onions. So since onions grew wild in so many regions, and they still do, they were probably consumed for thousands of years in their wild form and then domesticated simultaneously all over the world. So that explains the sort of, um, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's a disagreement, but the, the conflicting research that shows where they originated from, which 
brings me to um, the cultural significance and ethnobotanical uses of onions. Remember, ethnobotany is the study of a region's plants and their practical uses through the traditional knowledge of a local culture and its people. Anytime I cite these, these uses are cited as a historical and an anthropological resource. So never ingest the parts of any plant with being absolutely positive of its effect upon the human body, okay? But that being said, I don't think that there are any inedible or unusable parts of the onion plant. Research has shown that onions, and I'm going to take this directly quoting from the National Onion Association, are found to possess a panoply of bioactive compounds and numerous pharmacological properties, including antimicrobial, antioxidant, analgesic, anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetic, hypolipidemic, anti-hypertensive, and immunoprotective effects. Whew, that's a mouthful. But this is very similar to other alliums like garlic. They all have these organosulfur compounds that are linked to things like lowering blood pressure and cholesterol levels. So we have some scientific basis for the benefits of consuming onions, which is probably where a lot of these older uses and possibly myths um, came from. So traditionally, like in the Middle Ages, it was believed that onion juice could cure baldness, heal a snake bite, and um, cure a headache. Um, poultice of mashed onions used to be applied as a paste to cover wounds. It used to be prescribed to eat a whole onion at bedtime to break a cold overnight. No, thank you. Um, sliced onions were placed on the soles of the feet to draw out fever. And if you were on social media, you likely have seen people doing this nowadays um, to supposedly draw out toxins. I will reserve my comment on that one. Um, cough syrup by made by steeping raw onion slices in honey overnight. I could see how this might be a cough suppressant in some way, for sure. And then a raw onion rubbed on a bee sting or an insect bite will relieve the pain and itching. Not so sure reaching for an onion is going to be my first solution to that, but if it's all I've got around, I might give that a shot. So for nutrition, one medium onion, about 148 grams, contains 45 calories, 1 gram of protein, 11 grams of carbs, 0 grams of fat, 9 grams of sugars, and 3 grams of dietary fiber. They are also a good source of vitamin C, vitamin B6, potassium, folate, calcium, and iron. There is a good reason that we use onions in so much of our cooking in so many different cultures. For growing your own onions, let's let's talk a little bit about the cultivation of onions, right? One of the hardest things to learn when figuring out to, how to first start to grow onions was that onions are photoperiodic or sensitive to daylight. They start forming bulbs based on day length. So there are three different types of onions, short day, long day, and intermediate or day neutral. Most onion varieties are going to start forming their bulbs based on the temperature and the number of daylight hours. Short day onions start forming their bulbs when the daylight hours are between 10 and 12 hours. Long day onions don't start developing until the daylight is at least 14 to 16 hours per day. And then you have day neutral onions that will bulb during that sort of in-between day length of 12 to 14 hours, okay? This was the part that tripped me up the most because I couldn't figure out which one of those I fell into. Should I be doing short day? Should I be doing long day? The border between like where you grow long day and where you grow short day varieties lies roughly at a latitude of 36 degrees north, the 36th parallel. So anybody north of that should plant long day onions. Anybody south of that should plant short day onions. And just about everybody can grow day neutral or intermediate varieties. They're going to bulb just about anywhere. They do best at 12 hours of daylight, but they will form bulbs in just about any growing zone. Okay, so we'll, we'll touch on that again here in a little bit and the importance of choosing the right type of onion for your region. But first, let's talk about the difference between seeds, onion sets, and plants or transplants, because this is another point of confusion about when and how to grow onions. 
Yes, they can be direct seeded. It just depends on where you are. But most commonly, they are grown from transplants, either started inside or purchased, um, or from sets. So what is a set? As an onion set are small bulbs, and they are grown from seed the previous season. This was the first way that I started growing onions. The problem with this is that the ones from the garden center and some of your catalogs do not list whether or not these onion sets are long day or short day onions. So while they're going to grow for you, they may not actually form a bulb. You may only get the green part of the onions or some puny little bulbs with a lot of green growth. So unless you are absolutely sure that what you have is a long day onion set, to plant in your long day area or a short day to plant in your short day, you may be very disappointed with what you get. In most instances from what I have seen, the onion sets that you can buy in the garden center or, or online um, or out of catalogs are long day onions. So if you are a southern grower or even if you're sort of in the mid range area like where we are, we are sort of right on that border between long day and short day. A lot of the times these just aren't going to do well for you. We use them as green onions in the spring. I will take those little sets and plant them very closely together and we use them as green onions. I also use sets as my overwintered onions in the fall. We get spring onions from those. But in my experience, in doing this, they tend to bolt much more quickly than something that I have planted from a transplant in the spring. So my overwintered onions are going to be the first onions that we harvest that have a bulb, but not a full-sized bulb, and that also have lots of green leafy growth. So we can use them for both things. We call those our spring onions. But if I left them in the ground, the same amount of time that I would expect to for a full-sized onion, they would bolt before they got to that point. So that's that's what a set is, okay? And then plants or transplants, these are just newly sprouted onion seeds grown to about the size of like a skinny pencil or so before you transplant them. They're going to have um, a thick bottom on them and a little bit of roots ready to go and, and the green top and they're ready to drop in the ground, okay? So that's the difference between a set or a plant or a transplant. So I mentioned we would talk both in-ground cultivation and um, planting in containers. Let's talk about in-ground cultivation because there are several different ways that you can do this. Of course, you know, the sunlight and soil conditions are going to be very similar regardless of where you're growing them, but we'll focus on in-ground first, okay? You definitely want to have full sun. This does not mean you have to have 10 to 12 hours a day. Six to eight hours, preferably towards the eight-hour side, um, but six to eight hours is fine, okay? For soil conditions, well-drained soil, and high fertility. Now, I know we always say, oh, it needs to be planted in rich soil, high in organic matter. Yes. For most of our garden plants, that's what we're recommending. But for onions, it is particularly important. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, it, they do prefer a slightly acidic pH at about 6.2 to 6.8. That's pretty common for most garden vegetables. And even moisture and and plentiful moisture right good soil moisture is is important for good yields of bulb onions you want a weed free well drained location raised beds are fantastic for this um, onions are really good for intercropping with other garden plants too especially early maturing spring greens and they also vacate the bed partway through the season. So you have time to get another crop in as a succession. So absolutely you can grow onions and intermix them with other crops. You just don't want to plant them where anything else in the onion family, those alliums, um, have been grown in like the past three years. So this includes that garlic and those chives and shallots that we talked about at the beginning. If you want to grow them directly from seed, just keep in mind that direct sowing in the garden may not allow enough time for long season varieties to mature. But if you have a shorter season variety or you are in a warmer area or you just want to grow them from, for scallions, the skinny little onions that are harvested before the bulb forms, then you can absolutely direct sow, okay? Um, you want to wait until the soil gets around 50 degrees Fahrenheit 
um, before you plant them directly in the ground. They will germinate at a temperature between 45 and 95 Fahrenheit, but 50 is kind of where I say the minimum is for your best, your best germination percentage. Um, you plant the seed about a quarter inch deep, half an inch apart, do them in rows that are about 12 to 8 inch, 18 inches apart, and then once they come up and, and they start to get their green tops on them, then you're going to want to thin them down to about a four inch spacing in between each plant if you want those nice big large bulbs. Or you can do two inch spacing for smaller bulbs. You know, you'll get more onions in that instance. They'll just be a little bit smaller. Or if you want to just do the scallions, then just do them in one inch spacing, okay? So that's direct sowing. Now, if you want to use sets, this is another area where I sort of screwed up. You want to choose bulbs that are no larger than three quarter inch in diameter. I used to pick the biggest of those sets to use for my spring onions. And then if I had room to plant the little skinny ones, then I would go ahead and throw them in there. But the larger bulbs, when they start at a, at a size that's bigger than about three quarters of an inch, are much more prone to bolting before they start to size up. And I absolutely notice this um, every single year. There are some that will bolt way earlier than anybody else. And I think this is because, you know, those sets are the storage organ uh, and for energy for the plant. So I think when they're bigger than like that, they automatically recognize, you know, just in their biology that, oh, this is a second year that we're growing. It's time to go to seed. It's time to flower and put that seed out. So um, the bigger is not better in this instance. So three quarters of an inch or so in diameter. And then just gently press those into your soil about two to four weeks before your last frost date in the spring. Space them four to six inches apart again for those larger bulbs or two inches apart for smaller ones. And then if like me, you want to use them for scallions or green onions, use an even closer spacing if you want to pull them when they're immature. Just keep in mind, it is important that onions aren't planted too deep. This can affect the bulb development. We'll talk more about that here later on. Now you can grow your own sets. So if you want to start with sets because it seems easier for you, um, or you want to, you're in a warmer area and you want to overwinter them from sets, and you want to know for sure that you are getting the correct type of onion for your area, whether that's long day or short day, you can grow your own. You can take the seeds of the type of plant that you wanna grow and you can propagate them uh, on your own. So you can just sow the seeds in sort of a block in midsummer. Do this out in your soil. You can do it inside too, but you can just do this out in the garden. Just sow them really thickly in, in a block. And then about two months after planting, you should have plenty of green growth on the tops of those. Roll down those tops to force the plants to form these little small bulbs, okay? After the tops dry, Clip them off and leave about a half an inch of stem. You're going to cure those the same way that we will our actual storage onions and store them in a cool, dry place the same way that you would your onions for eating. And then hold on to them and plant them the following spring or the following fall if you can hang on to them long enough in order to be able to plant them um, for an overwintered planting. But again, if you are in a warmer area, you can actually leave those um, as, as the bulbs themselves rather than crimping them down and storing them. You'll just separate them and put them into their permanent little home and then let them go dormant that way and come back up the following spring. So multiple different ways to do this, okay? Um, and then finally, there's starting, you know, doing them from transplants, which is the way that we do it. You can start your own um, or you can purchase them from a catalog or from an online supplier. Very easy to start your own. Put your plant, uh, your seeds in a flat or different cell trays. You want to start this probably about eight to 12 weeks before your last frost date. Um, four or five seeds in each cell, or you can do them just in flats about a half an inch apart. Let them go ahead and sprout up. If the tops start to grow too tall and they start to droop, you can trim them back um, about to about a three-inch height with just scissors. 
And then you want to make sure that you start them early enough to give yourself time to harden them off and get them into the ground about two to six weeks before your last frost. And that's a little bit wider of a range than, say, from set because these plants are going to be a little bit more sensitive. These are actively growing green baby plants. These are seedlings for all intents and purposes. And so you need to make sure that you harden them off a little bit. And depending on your area and how early you are trying to plant, um, you may have to adjust your timing. The earlier, the better. But, you know, the transplants can handle frost, but they may not survive an extended deep freeze. So just keep that in mind when you're starting these out. So whether you started them yourself or you've purchased them, again, put them out about two to six weeks before your last estimated spring freeze. Um, trim the roots to about a half an inch before you transplant them and then trim those tops back to about that three to four inch height. This is going to spur the growth in both the roots and the shoots. It's going to encourage nutrient and water uptake as soon as you plant and get them off to the best start. Now, there are multiple ways that you can grow onions in ground. The way that professional uh, commercial onion farms grow them is by the trench method. So you are going to dig a trench that's about four inches deep and four inches wide. And this is where you're going to put your fertilizer or your soil amendments, whatever it is that you're going to use to feed these plants. And we'll talk about nutrients here in, in a second. Um, so put that in the trench and then cover your fertilizer or your amendments up with about two inches of soil. And then you plant the onions um, on both sides of the trench. You don't plant them in the trench. You plant them on the sides. So six inches from the edge of the trench on both sides, start planting your onions there. Four inches apart, one inch deep, no deeper, um, four inches apart for the large bulbs, two inches, you know, for the smaller ones, just like we talked about. And if you want, like, both, if you want some green onions and you also want the big onions, then if you plant them two inches apart and then pull every other onion during the growing season, you use those as green onions and then you can leave the rest to grow to maturity. So you can get both out of the same bed. That's the trench method. The row method is basically the same way that you would plant any other crop in your garden. Um, you just need to mind the spacing. So two to four inches, however you want. Um, plant them uh, in rows that are 10 to 12 inches apart. Now, again, these are all just recommendations. And based on how your gar or your gar like based on how your garden um, is configured and grows, you can probably get away with zhuzhing this around a little bit. I use the same dibbler for planting my onions as I do for my garlic. And so basically my onions are planted at the same spacing as my garlic. So my dibbler is um, spacing the plants six inches apart across. So... I'm not doing these individual little rows. I'm doing them more in blocks. And then I will I will plant them um, four inches apart as I go. So I'll just space the plants basically are four inches apart in rows that are only six inches apart. But then after I get six plants wide, then there's like a 12 to 18 inch gap between that block and the next. It just works better for me because it's a tool that I already have and it makes it go faster for me. So keep this in mind, you know, as you hear all these different recommendations for spacing and do what you need to to fit them into your garden plan and your garden layout. If you're just going to put them all six inches apart completely, you know, next to each other, that's fine as long as they have enough room. It, it, more than four inches is okay if they have six inches all the way around. But if you go four inches apart in the row, then make sure you've got about a foot between that row and the next one. They need to have that airflow, okay? Um, with the row method, you either want to incorporate your fertilizer or your amendments into the bed before you plant, or you can side dress with it after you plant and then water it in really well. Um, my recommendation and what I like to do is to incorporate it into the soil first and then save the side dressing for the subsequent feedings, which you're going to need to do about every two to three weeks. And we'll talk about that in the, in the next section. And there is one more method for planting in ground, and that is the group method. So you are going to plant groups of three onion plants 10 inches apart 
in rows that are 10 to 12 inches apart. Okay, so three onions plants in the same hole, but you're planting them 10 inches apart instead of, you know, the two to four inches apart. This allows for all three onions to spread out and grow to full size. Doing it this way makes it easier for weeding in between the plants when they're really small, and it can make for a very quick method of planting, and it may work better for some bed spaces. It's kind of fun to watch these little triple bunches of onions grow to maturity and sort of outgrow their space. It just means at harvest, you'll be pulling them apart at the roots because they will intertwine with each other. Um, but this is kind of a fun a fun method to, to, to use to, to grow onions, which leads me into container growing. You can absolutely grow onions in containers. You just need to be sure that the container is somewhere where it's going to get the six to eight hours of, of sun, preferably eight. Um, we're looking for good top growth and the more daylight, the better. It doesn't have to be 10 or 12, six to eight is fine. Use a good potting soil or a potting soil compost mix. Nutrients and proper drainage are key here. And then you want to make sure you're using a good fertilizer or nitrogen amendment. Feeding is going to be done on the same schedule as the in-ground plants. More on that in a minute. I keep saying that, I know, but we'll get there. <laughs> your consideration for your spacing when you are growing in containers. Either be sure that the containers are wide enough to accommodate multiple plants at four inches apart, or use the grouping method that I just mentioned if you're using smaller containers. Just be sure that you have about 10 inches or 25 centimeters of soil in the container. This will prevent the plants from drying out too quickly, which can absolutely stunt their growth. Um, so in this case, wider is better than deeper. So if you use smaller containers, just be prepared to water more, okay? And speaking of water, you wanna make sure that these containers are well-drained, but you also don't wanna let them get bone dry. So you're gonna to need to check pretty frequently, and when the soil three inches down is dry, you're gonna to have to water. Onions, like most of the rest of our garden plants, really only require about an inch um, of rain every, or rain or water, however you get to them, um, of, of water a week, right? When they're in containers, you're probably looking at closer to two to three inches or five to eight centimeters. Um, just so be prepared to water more frequently than for like larger raised beds or for in-ground growing. Now, no matter the method of planting or growing, there are certain tips that will help you get your best harvest of onions, okay? Mulch, once again, <laughs> always your friend. Uh, mulching with straw in between the rows is gonna help retain moisture and it's gonna keep those weeds down. Onions have shallow root systems and so they need consistent moisture and they really rely on good weed control because they don't do well with the competition. You may need to water weekly if the weather is very dry. Um, so mulching to retain that moisture is, is going to be very important. One thing to understand about growing onions is that we kind of want to think of them more as a leaf crop, like lettuce or kale, and, and treat them as such with regards to their water needs and also their nutrient needs. So don't think about it as a root crop. It's not a beet or a carrot. The more leafy growth that you have at the top of the onion before that bulbing process starts, the larger the onion will be. We're looking, ideally, for 13 leaves. That's like the epitome of the, of the best top growth and, and big green foliage. Large healthy tops lead to that optimum bulb size. So it's important to give the plant enough time to size up prior to bulbing. So this is where that line of latitude comes in. Understanding what your temperature conditions are where you garden when the daylight hours begin to lengthen after winter, right? So when are your days between 10 and 12 hours and, and how warm is it when that happens, right? If it's late winter or it's early spring and your temperatures are already pretty mild and your garden is taking off nicely, yeah, you likely live below the 36th parallel and you are somebody who needs short day onion varieties, okay? So when planted at the right time, 
your onions will have plenty of time to grow those leafy green tops before starting to form their bulbs. If your temperatures don't really start to warm up until your daylight hours hit at least 14 hours per day, then you are likely above the 36th parallel and you need to grow long day or day neutral onions. Your plants need more time to put on those leafy greens because the temperature conditions are colder for much longer and that slows the plant growth. If you were to grow short day onions, there won't be enough time for those onions to grow their tops before the day length triggers that bulbing process and you end up with small onions. This was the part that I just could not wrap my head around when we first started growing onions. And it makes more sense now, but of course here we are over a decade later. And, <laughs> and so now I know, but back then I had no clue, okay? And again, if you live in a warmer climate and you're somewhere south, you know, Southern California, you know, down in Texas or Southern Florida, and you have very, very mild winters, you very well are a candidate for actually planting in the fall and having them overwinter because as soon as the daylight hours start to, to lengthen again, and as soon as it starts to warm up, that growth is going to take off. And so you are going to have a, a, a better chance of having that leafy growth before the onions start to form their bulbs. And you're also going to get an earlier harvest. Okay. So fostering all of that healthy foliage growth is going to ensure that your plants have enough energy to form large bulbs under the soil. How do we get lots of leafy growth in all of our other plants, especially our leafy greens? Nitrogen, right? So for the best growth and yield, onions need to be fed right from the start. That's why I talked about using an amendment or a fertilizer at the very beginning when you are prepping your bed. And that initial feeding should be around equal amounts of your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. So if you're using a fertilizer, or something like a 10-10-10 or even a 10-20-10 would be fine. Um, if you're using an organic amendment, making sure that you have equal levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is what you want in the soil prior to planting. After that, you'll focus on amendments that are mainly nitrogen. Remember, we're looking for big foliage here. And so you're going to side dress with that nitrogen, or if you use the trenching method, you're going to put it right over top of where your initial amendments went um, every two to three weeks after planting. Okay, they are heavy nitrogen feeders because they want that green growth. Okay, you're going to stop fertilizing when the onions begin to bulb. Now, because this is triggered by day length. When this occurs after planting is going to vary based on when you planted them and the region you live in. This is why I can't say, well, stop feeding them, you know, four weeks after you planted them or six weeks after you planted them because I don't know when you put those in the ground. I don't know what your, your temperatures have been like, what your day like is. So I can't give you a specific time for when you should stop feeding. The only surefire way to know is a visual inspection. So when the ground begins to crack around the plants and the soil starts to push away, that means that bulbing has started. So stop feeding the plants at that point. Those bulbs are now going to rely on the energy stored in those green tops to move down into the storage organ, which is what the bulb is, okay? So while our early plants should stay covered with that light mulch to protect them and retain the moisture and suppress the weeds, we do not want to cover our emerging onions. Do not put the soil back around the onions as they pop up out of the soil. It needs to emerge above the soil for best growth. And that mulch that you had down should mean that you don't have to consistently water. Like I mentioned, about an inch of water per square foot per week, including rainwater, is sufficient. Now, if you want sweeter onions, you can water more. And if you've got a really hot spell, um, you can actually water more, even up to two inches per week, um, to prevent them from bolting, okay? So long as your soil is well-draining and the roots and the bulbs aren't sitting in that water. Now, that being said, we 
don't irrigate our onions because spring is our wet season and we generally get enough water that it doesn't affect bulb size as the plants move more uh, toward maturity. But in years where we get very little rain, we do have smaller onions and they are definitely more pungent. So I, that, you know, watering them to make them a little bit sweeter, yeah, that's absolutely true. So just understand soil moisture is going to affect both size and flavor. And so you've got your onions planted, you've got them mulched, they're growing nicely, they're starting to bulb. What pests and disease do we have to worry about with onions? I will say, thankfully, onions are one of the crops that I have not ever had a pest or a disease problem in. Knock on wood, because, uh, you know, everything else has had a pest or disease problem, so hopefully it stays that way. I, I do know, though, in my area for sure, um, that some growers have had problems with thrips. Thrips are tiny little insects. They're like about as fat as the tip of a sewing needle. So very hard to see. Um, you can tell if you've got thrips if you take um, a, a dark piece of paper out into the garden and you knock the onion tops against it. If thrips are there, you're going to see them. They're tan colored, almost white, and you'll see them on the paper. Generally speaking, a couple treatments with an insecticidal soap will kill them off. You know, always follow the directions with whatever it is that you're using, but spray the plants twice, uh, three days apart, and the thrips should disappear. That should take care of them. If you see that this is a problem and you think there's, you know, it's going to be a sort of a, a repeat infestation every single season, then you may want to um, use insect netting that is specifically designed for thrips. It needs to be a specific sized mesh in order to keep them out because they are so tiny. But if you put that over top of your plants after you put them in the ground, then that'll keep the thrips away. The other pest that I know of for onions is onion maggots. Um, the onion maggot fly likes to lay its eggs at the base of plants. So again, if you're using an insect netting, that's going to prevent that. Um, you just need to make sure that you seal that insect netting down by um, mounting the soil around the edges to keep the fly from going underneath. And then if you do know that you have a problem in it with maggot fly, then you also probably want to keep the mulch away from the base of the plant because the insects like the decaying organic matter. Um, and then just make sure that you're harvesting your onions as the season progresses. Onion maggots are usually a problem in very rainy periods, so this, you know, these precautions may be unnecessary if you have a really dry season. And then with diseases... Um, white rot is, is a bad one. This is actually a pretty serious disease. If it's not already in your soil, you get it through infected plant material. So before you go to plant onions, check your university extension website to see if they have any mention of white rot. And that way, you know, you should probably stick to starting, um, your onions from seed yourself or using onion sets or transplants that you buy from an inspected producer to make sure that they do not have it in their soil. With white rot, the foliage on your onion plant will start to yellow and wilt, but the problem really is below ground because it gets this white, fluffy, fungal growth at the base of the bulb. And unfortunately, once white rot sets in, there is no fix for it. You have to dig up the crop and dispose of it in the trash. Do not compost it because you don't want to keep it around. You also want to avoid growing onions in or anything in the onion family in the same location in future seasons because unfortunately it will remain in the soil for years. So hopefully you don't have to deal with white rot. The only other two onion diseases that I've seen that are prevalent in any areas are purple blotch and botrytis leaf blight. With both of these, you can usually prevent them by keeping the foliage dry. I mean, obviously other than rainfall, um, but if you water like early in the day so that the above ground plant parts dry as quickly as possible, Avoid wetting them if at all possible. Um, avoid crowding your plants. Make sure that you have plenty of space for air circulation, which also means keeping the weeds pulled around the plants just to help with that air circulation. Um, symptoms of purple blotch, you know, the symptoms can occur on leaves as small, sunken, whitish flecks with purple-colored centers, hence the purple blotch. Um, and this can cause the leaves or the stalk to start drooping, which means that the infected plants are not going to develop bulbs. 
the symptoms of botrytis leaf blight. Again, more small lesions. These are grayish white. They're often surrounded by silvery white halo. Um, the older lesions tend to be brownish and kind of dried out. And when you get too many lesions on the leaf, um, the leaf will tend to die back. And again, this is going to affect the bulb growth. So if you see symptoms of either of these, you just have to practice a little plant sanitation. When the plant leaf surfaces are dry, you just carefully remove the parts of the plant that you see have been affected. And hopefully that curbs the spread of the infection. Um, and at the end, end of the season, just or after you harvest, make sure you wake up all of the fallen or diseased leaves and remove them from the area. Again, don't compost these because most home compost piles aren't going to get hot enough to kill them off. Okay, so you've navigated your way through the pests and the diseases, and so now it's time to harvest, right? First things first, if at any point during the season you see onions that start to send up flower stalks, make sure you harvest them right away. This means that the bulbs have stopped growing. They're not going to store well. They're not going to get any bigger at that point. Um, you can still use them, absolutely. I would use them probably within a few days to a week, um, but you're not going to be able to cure those and store them long term. Um, spring planted onions tend to be ready for harvest by about midsummer. Fall planted onions in the warmer areas are going to mature much earlier than that, so keep an eye on them because, again, if you leave them in the ground too long, then they're going to try to bolt and go to flower. So when onions start to mature, the tops, the foliage, will start to become yellow and sort of wilt over or fall over. At that point, you can actually like bend the tops down. I've even seen people stomp on the foliage to speed the, the ripening process up. You don't have to do this. Um, it's just a way to kind of encourage them to hurry up and finish up the process. You also could loosen the soil up around the bulbs to encourage them to start to dry out already while they're still on the ground. Um, you don't have to do any of this. You can just wait until they completely fall over on their own, and then you'll know that um, that they are mature. Usually the tops are going to be mostly brown at this point. You do want to harvest, though, while the weather is dry. If the onions are still wet when they're harvested, they don't tend to cure as, as well, and they might rot while they're in storage. You also want to handle them fairly carefully when you are harvesting them. Any bruising, um, either now or while they're in storage, will actually encourage them to rot. So once you've got them out of the ground, if it's warm and there's a nice breeze, you can absolutely set your onions on the dry ground for a few days to cure in the sun. Now, if your sun is blazing, you can prevent them from getting sun scald by just laying the tops of each other over top of each other's bulbs, if that makes sense. You sort of overlay them. Um, but if this makes you nervous and you're worried about sun scald, you can absolutely move them out of the direct light. We have um, wire shelves that or wire racks, I guess, that we set up under a tree line. So if the sun is being completely unrelenting, we will lay them out on those on those racks and lay them out to dry that way. Um, you can also put them in a protected place like a garage or a barn or a basement if the weather isn't going to be dry enough to do this outside. But how long your onions will keep absolutely depends on how you treat them after harvest. They have to be dried thoroughly in order to avoid problems with rot. So you can either do this by leaving them outside, um, or again, if you don't have a, a good place to do this or the outside of the rain is expected, then you need to dry them indoors. So they need to be in a warm, dry place with really good air circulation. Either hang them up to allow the air to reach all sides of the onions or lay them out in a single layer and then just sort of periodically roll them over to allow them to dry evenly. Um, if the weather isn't conducive to doing this outside, I like to put mine down in the seedling room downstairs where it's cool. We just lay them out on the wire racks that I usually use for the plants. And then I have the fans going to help dry them out. This is basically the same way that I do my garlic. I do prefer to cure them outside if possible because it's definitely faster and I seem to get better results. Your onions are going to be fully cured and ready for storage when the necks are no longer green 
and the necks of the bulb are completely closed up. The entire neck where the leaves meet the bulb should be dry all the way to the surface of the onion. And then the skin should have a more uniform texture and color than they were when you first pulled them out. You don't want to cut the tops off prior to knowing that they are bone dry like this because you're at a higher risk for bacteria getting into the bulb and starting the spoiling process. So once the onions are thoroughly dry, then you can clip the roots off, you can cut back the tops to about an inch unless you're doing a braid for storage, um, and now they're ready to eat or to be put away in storage. Before you put them away, look for signs of sprouting or damage or bruise or anything before you put them away. A sprout or a bruise is definitely going to shorten an onion's shelf life. They're still edible, so take those ones and put them in your kitchen and use them first um, because they will likely go bad sooner than the other ones will. Once you've inspected them and you want to put them away from storage, you either can hang them like in a mesh bag or in a nylon stocking. Um, you can spread them out up to two layers deep in a box with some holes for ventilation. Um, or you can keep the tops on and braid them and then hang them in a cool, dry, well-ventilated area. I've not done the braid thing with onions like I have my garlic, but I may do this just once for just showing them off in my kitchen like I do my garlic. Um, we generally put them into mesh bags and then we lay the bags flat on wire racks so that they're not piled on top of each other in the bag more than two onions deep. It works better for us than hanging, but that's because we're storing several hundred pounds. If I were just storing for us, I'd definitely just be hanging a few smaller bags in my basement and calling it good because then I could save the shelf space for other things. The key is you just don't want them piled on top of each other for long-term storage, okay? The ideal temperature range for storage is 40 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 to 15 Celsius. Do not store them in your refrigerator. It's going to be too humid for them in there and they will either sprout or they will start to rot. And then once they are in storage, just check periodically for them sprouting or rotting. Pull those ones out. You also don't want to store your onions with apples or pears. Apples and pears both give off ethylene gas and that will interrupt the onion's dormancy and they will try to sprout. So definitely don't store those together and you usually don't want to store them with potatoes either because the onions can spoil the flavor and give the potatoes an off flavor. Um, they can do the same thing with apples or pears too. So, And then keep in mind with storage, a pungent onion, those hotter onions, are going to store longer than a sweet onion. So sweet onions have a higher water content, so they don't keep well in storage for an extended period of time. Um, sweeter onions, like the Walla Wallas that we grow each year, have a storage time of about a month or two, whereas like a well-cured and properly handled, more pungent onion, like the Spanish yellow that we grow, can keep for like four to seven months, sometimes longer. Um, so we will grow both. We grow the Walla Wallas and we sell those as our sweet onions and sell them all the way through the summer into the early fall. Once we run out of those, then we start to sell the Spanish yellow because we know those will keep. And so we'll sell those through the fall. And then those are our winter storage onions. We use those all winter long and continue to sell them as well until we basically run out. So if you're growing multiple varieties, eat the sweet varieties first and save the more pungent onions for later. That's it for onions. I know that that is a ton of information to process. So I threw together a quick reference sheet for you that I will link to in the show notes that you can keep with your garden journal or your crop plan so it's handy throughout the season. And like I said, it took me a while to get a handle on all of this in my own gardens. And I have resources that I refer back to every single year because it's virtually impossible to remember all of this for every single crop every single season, right? So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed by this or any crop in your garden, that's completely normal. Keep references on hand while you're planning and while you're working, and you'll feel a little more confident that you do know what you're doing, or at least you're faking it really well, right? <laughs> Until next time, my gardening friends, keep on cultivating that dream garden, and we'll talk again soon. 
You just finished another episode of the Just Grow Something podcast. For more information about today's topic, go to justgrowsomethingpodcast.com where you can find all the episodes, show notes, articles, courses, newsletter sign up, and more. I'd also love for you to head to Facebook and join our gardening community in the Just Grow Something Gardening Friends Facebook group. Until next time, my gardening friends, keep learning and keep growing.